Star Wars. <laughs> Nothing but Star Wars. Give me the Star Wars. Don't let them in. That's right. For over 40 years, the world has had Star Wars. And since it is the month of May, we've got four episodes devoted to the world of Star Wars. And to lead off this first episode is, is compositor, VFX artist, and virtual production supervisor over at Industrial Light and Magic in London, where she works on shows like The Mandalorian and upcoming shows like Star Wars and or the wonderful Charmaine Chan. And in this episode, Charmaine really walks us through some of the skill set, but really the mindset the mindset of what it takes to be someone who works in visual effects. It's a little bit different than being a pen and paper artist because now as things are much more collaborative, you're working with multiple departments, not just computers, to create these vast and wonderful worlds that we see on TV and on the big screen. But before we begin, please take a moment to hit subscribe on whatever platform or device you're listening to so you never miss an episode of Creative Mind. Star Wars is a big part of this conversation, but I really want to focus with you on being a compositor, being somebody with the technical and creative knowledge. The question I've got to ask first, how did you get a job at Star Wars? How, how did that happen? What was the path to that? That is a very, very good question. It was one of those things where, you know, funny enough for me, ILM was actually more of a bigger influence on me revolving around Indiana Jones than oh, it was good, for good. Star Wars. It was one of those people who definitely jumps on the Star Wars bandwagon probably a little later in life. I didn't watch the first Star Wars until maybe high school or something like that. Getting into ILM is tough. That's without a doubt. Their expectations of people is a very high bar, but it's just one of those things where, you know, I was very adamant about working with the best people in the industry. And for me, I wanted my foot in the door, no matter what that position was. I actually originally applied for an art department PA position. And the recruiter who was working with me actually looked at my resume because I had a lot more scripting and programming in my background. And it definitely catered more towards TA, which is a technical assistant type of position. So she asked me if I would be interested in applying for that instead. Just to clarify, that for when you were saying art department PA, I come from a, a bit of a film background. So is that the actual, you know, let's let's set up stuff, grab the paper towels, clean up after we're done. Let's do this, build those boxes type PA, or was it more of a digital art direction department? I think it was a little bit of both because I feel like the art department PAs definitely will need to bring in whatever materials are needed for the artists and, you know, help assist whoever needs extra hand, but, you know, at the same time, we are a very digital medium. So you will be helping prep files or like convert things or send things, typical digital kind of media that's needed. I felt like I was very much experienced for that type of role, but it seemed like they wanted to utilize my technical background a bit more and they felt the TA position would work better. And I interviewed for that. And luckily I answered everything right. And, you know, they gave me an offer to be a TA. How long have you been at ILM now? I've been at ILM, it'll be 15 years in January, so about quite a good chunk of my okay. adult life. So you are fully immersed into the industrial light and magic world. Oh, I mean, completely. That, that's rare for anybody to have that long of a career at one place, which is not to glad hand them, but I mean, just that must be a really nice place to work if you've been there for 15 years. There must be something there special for you that makes ILM and working in that world unique. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm generally a person who, unless I'm learning and growing, there's no reason for me to be somewhere. And I feel like ILM has been such a great environment that pushes for that type of mentality. And everyone there, like, hands down, the people make the company. Like, everyone is so friendly, so nice, but also so knowledgeable and so skillful. You can't really get any better of a deal, right? Like once you get in there, you get to work with and learn from the best. And, you know, even though there's people who've been there from 40 years to those who just started, they all have such a different set of skills that once we like collaborate and combine them all together, we get those like amazing results that you see on the screen. We're going to come back to, you know, what it takes to get there and just, you know, the advice for students, because, you know, at the same time, you know, we are talking to students and their support staff. But 
I kind of want to focus on a little bit of the here and now. We're, we're with COVID. And, you know, one of the big projects you're working on, of course, is The Mandalorian. And The Mandalorian is famous for its big virtual sets and virtual world. And that is a game changer long before we got into COVID. Briefly, what are you seeing the future is going to look like? Some things that you've learned now that we've had a year of working in this COVID era on actual production. What are some things you're seeing that may change things or things we need to think about going forward? COVID definitely spinned the whole world around, um, especially in our industry. But at the same time, we realize there are different ways that we can still work and create and produce the content that we usually do. Working from home is definitely very different, but you know, we had an amazing IT team that was able to get us up and running so that we can still work on our content. But at the same time, you know, there are some downfalls of not being able to see your colleagues and like collaborate super easily. Because I think one of the best things about working in an office is like you can just walk over to someone's desk and be all like, hey, that looks super cool. What'd you do there? You know, we kind of lose that in a working from home scenario. But at the same time, I feel like one of the things that working from home has been good about was that we can now, we never used to really everyone be able to dial into dailies. Like you would get called into dailies and everyone just comes in one at a time. Nowadays, you can just hop into any Zoom call, watch dailies and, you know, actually see content from stuff that you're not working on and seeing how other people are, you know, doing their shots as well. Again, there's pros and cons to it all, but I feel like working from home perspective, there's definitely been some pros for sure. But beyond just working on visual effects post-production content, one thing great about Mandalorian is that it definitely kickstarted the conversations and ideas with a lot of studios and clientele about shooting at a single stage location, right? So because of COVID, we're so locked down to just being in one kind of area. It makes, you know, shooting on location very difficult. And with virtual production, especially with real-time rendering and the LEDs, we can be in New York one day, Iceland the next day. And it's all, you know, like all there loaded or actually you can all be there in the same day, right? We're just changing different loads. So it reduces the need to have a cast and crew fly all over the place and put them at risk during this pandemic and limit it to a very safe environment where people are constantly being tested and adhering to COVID standards and still give the ability for the directors and the crew to create and film what they need. Well, that's good because that that's kind of the question. All you know, we're always having it's like, ooh, what's going to happen? It's like, ooh, some of this is working out. Some of this work from home is working out. Some of this COVID stuff, we're finding new ways to do it. And it's interesting how it does kind of dovetail and you know, with Mandalorian being the new way of working or a possible new way of working. I don't want to you know harp on the Mandalorian all the time, but for you as somebody who has spent a lot of time in visual effects and compositing. Is Mandalorian the future or is it a tool in a toolbox? Well, let me rephrase that again. It's not the Mandalorian. Is the way we're making the Mandalorian and the LED walls and these virtual sets, do you see that as a new way of doing things or just a tool in the toolbox? Everyone is very much wanting to shoot everything, real-time rendered LED walls, you know, that whole virtual production suite of tools. But there's a very specific. It's so easy. We never have to fix it, it in post, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's like you just push a button and everything comes up magically, right? And it's like lit it's and just set that up easy, exactly right? how it should be. Yeah. No. It is definitely more a tool to help creatives get what they need. I feel like it's there as an aid. It's there to be an additional toolkit for gaffers, for DPs, for directors. It's not so much the answer for how you should shoot everything going forward. Because, yeah, like I was saying earlier, I feel like the LED is used best for very specific scenarios, such as set extensions, environment work. But, you know, in no way is it replacing how actually shooting life that will always be needed. That will always be our grounding, right? It's our foundation of what we see as real out there. But, you know, when it comes to the Star Wars universe and, you know, being on a completely different planet that doesn't exist or up in space. There are some things you just can't shoot at. So right, right, right. I think it absolutely helps, you know, enhance that feeling of being at a location that doesn't actually exist because, yeah, there's it's it's still there's, space. Again, we, we haven't we haven't gone there. yet. It's still space. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> we haven't dragged all the cameras and stuff up there soon they say. no plus you know there's a lack of light in space so that might be a little that's bit right as right well. and the sound i mean all our sound guys are completely uh you know they're out of work up there for production and for compositing now that you've got virtual production and you know compositing and when a lot of people think compositing they think oh it's just computers how hard can it be you can put anything in there but you and i had talked briefly before we started there's still a practicality and a mix of practical versus digital. You're talking about gaffers and lighting, you know, real versus computer. As a compositor, what are you looking for and how are you working with all of the creative teams to create a vision for a final project? I think what compositing does really well is that it's generally the last point in the pipeline, right? It goes through a compositor before the shot goes out the door to be put up on the screens. And the great thing about being a compositor is that you're the one who gets to bring in all these different elements, right? Whether it be the plate shot, the CG renders that are being used, or, you know, additional photography that you may have done in your own home to help supplement, you know, uh, a shot. It's one of those things where you get to work with so many different departments, right? Not only are you working with lighters, but you need to talk to your match move artists. You need to talk to paint artists, you know? It's such a great discipline that lets you really collaborate and see how everyone works. I feel like because I had that foundation, because I'm so used to working that way as a compositor, when I was placed on set, it was no different, except now I'm working with the IT gaffers, even the sound people will ask us, like, can I put, you know, some curtains up here to just reduce the bounce? And you're like, oh, no, you can't do that. It's going to block the light, you know. And so it's like you have to really work as a team to help figure out how everyone can get their best product. Because at the end of the day, what do we see through the camera? What are we hearing through the camera? Does it all work together? So, yeah, I think the way I work as a compositor really got put to test when I was being put out on set. And it's such a joy being able to, you know, really work with these film crews because we generally don't have to worry about things like how is that lit on set? How is that, you know, set up for the set design and the props and stuff like that? Usually we're just given it and we're like, you got to work with what you have. Um, so to <laughs> it's now your be... job to fix it, just just <laughs> make it good, right? <laughs> yeah. You can, so now you to can be erase able to... us walking around in the background, right? I mean, it is true, but still, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, it's nice to be finally able to interact with the people who really put it all together before it even goes to post. Okay. Let me ask you this then. What are some things that you have learned now that you're getting to really guide your directors and your creators and your producers and you said even the sound team? What are some things that you, if you can go into a little more depth on, some best practices when you're doing compositing and actually being on set and being a part of that process? What are some things that you are seeing that maybe you hadn't seen before or some things you're like, wow, this is, this is how we can make this even better. Yeah. It's one of those things where I think, especially with, you know, your DP and your gaffer, I'm generally talking with them every single minute about how we essentially light a scene because we're working together because you know, the LEDs, it's amazing technology. It's crazy that we can do it these days, but it is limited to a certain amount of brightness, right? We can never achieve the brightness of a hot sun from LED. So it's one of those You're things the, where... not going to get the big BFL yeah. LED yet. It's never going to never gonna yeah. happen yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just one of those things where they also know the limitations of the LEDs. And it's where we figure out, all right, so for, you know, just the base diffuse lighting... That's what the LED is going to be doing. But we definitely need this like hot key light, which will, you know, bring in practically. But we also don't want to flash out the walls. So we're going to then put a flag up here. And it's just one of those things where it's a very organic workflow where you're kind of bouncing ideas off with everyone. And you're able to then light the scene as perfect as possible where you don't need to do any posts where you can get in camera finals, which is the main goal. And to be able to do that at the beginning is, I think, the biggest sell point of being able to use virtual production and LEDs. That's got to be an interesting conversation when you're actually telling a DP, hey, my job as a compositor is to light this better. Can we light this better now? Or is the conversation, hey, I don't know what you want to do, but this is what this is going to look like. And it looks kind of 
poopy? How can we make it a little bit better? I I definitely think, you know, we work with amazing DPs who really know what they're doing and DPs who are super excited for this technology. I can see the potential of this technology. So it's really a case where we are correcting folks. It's more a scenario of this DP is trying to achieve a certain style or look that you've been doing from scene to scene. Are we able to do that strictly with the LEDs or do we feel like the LEDs won't be able to reproduce that, so we should mention, hey, we might need additional lights to get that same look that you wanted. So yeah, it's again just open conversations that we're constantly having with the DPM and gaffers. Okay. For compositing, a, lo- a lot of times compositing has always been looked at as the dark room, all the computers, and the 15-hour day of trying to erase all the things, make something look better, change everything. Then somebody comes back and he goes, nah, make it all purple. You got to go back and redo it. When a student and somebody new in the industry is really starting to get into compositing, what are those things that you now know with your experience and working on production? Those first things to think of before sitting down at the computer and yelling and screaming at it. As a compositor, you are basically given a million shots and tasks to complete in a very short amount of time. And so there's a lot of, uh, what's feasible, what's realistic, and how do I get there the quickest way? And so I think one thing that I, you know, really wish I learned earlier, you know, for us, a lot of times we, we get plates that was already filmed and we're adding CG elements or doing background replacements. And, you know, a lot of times there's just like, you have your main reference, just match that. And as an artist starting off, I was very much like, I want to be as creative as I want to be. I want to like add a pony here and rainbows there. And it's just one of those things where like, you're so excited and you're so ready to do things and be as creative as possible, where you just like start turning all the knobs to like 110%, you know? And it's just one of those things where it's all like, no, just calm down a little and realize that like, we have the photography that we're matching to and, you know, just keep it simple. You know, the more simple you approach compositing, the better you'll get. And, you know, there's definitely one of those things where people are like, oh, I have to have a giant nuke script with like a million nodes that shows that I'm like a senior compositor and really know what I'm doing. And I'm like, no, like I can do the same thing in like five nodes. You know, like it's more about thinking about your process is more and how you approach things to get the most realistic, true matching imagery. Again, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on some of the different projects you've worked on. We'll kind of go through some of the projects you've worked on that you know you're super proud of. It seems like for the best thing, it's about making something look realistic, or is it about making something look otherworldly? Yeah, that's a really good point. It definitely varies depending on whichever projects you're working on. You know, you definitely have the more realistic type of visual effects type projects, which are like you know, whether it be James Bond or Mission Impossible, there's there's huge effects that happen in there, but at the same time, it's still very much is this realistic and true to the real world. But then you have, you know, Marvel projects where you're like, again, you're out in space in some kind of quantum micro universe or something, right? I where can you're finally like, make purple fire. I've always like, what I wanted to do is exactly, make purple fire. Exactly. I can do it now. <laughs> and so even though there's like those two ends of the spectrum, At the end of the day, even though there's those super unknown, like you have nothing in the real world to actually see that, we still try to ground that to reality. Like you're saying purple magic fire. Sure, there could be purple magic fire, but like, first off, how does fire look? How does fire work? How does the light of fire interact with things? If you bring that foundation over and make that then purple with a little bit more whimsical, I don't know, sparks or something like that you're still using something you know in real life as a basis for it. So it's definitely something where you want to start off with something you know that exists in the real world and then build off of that to then be more creative about where you can go with it. You mentioned foundations and and talking a lot about how it responds and what something looks like. And we're going to use fire as an example. How do you study or visualize or look at something that you're now recreating. What is it that you're looking for as a compositor and an artist that you're just nerding out on how this 
reacts and looks and feels. What are the things you're looking for to recreate or to enhance? A lot of times I actually tell a lot of the artists on my team to literally turn off your computer, step away and go outside. It's just one of those things where you get so much inspiration by things in the real world. I can literally sit on a bench somewhere and just like stare at the corner of a building and see like how the light just goes across that building throughout the day. It's just one of those things that I find very relaxing and being able to just like study how light interacts with a lot of things in real life. I think that's why I also really love photography and just being able to capture a moment when you see that like still it's like let's then deconstruct it what's going on in this you know image and so for me i constantly refer to what i see out my window or you know when i'm walking down the street things like that because it will always come back to you and also google image is your friend <laughs> like i'm always constantly like hmm rainy day you that you know where's that where's that folder of purple magic fire i know i saw it somewhere i'm not the only person to think of absolutely that. to me it's like i love reference it's i think it's really fun having reference you know once you start working in an industry for a while you're going to realize that there are definitely themes and things that come up quite often that you need to add within your shot when you're compositing and so build your own little library of like images you can constantly refer to. Oh, that's interesting because, yeah, it, it, it does make sense if you're constantly, you know, if you become the action movie compositor. It's like, well, you better learn what fire looks like. You better learn what explosions and smoke and debris and rubble and things look actually look like as opposed to I think that. Yeah, it looks like an explosion. It's good enough because we've all seen those movies where you're like, I don't think that thing's on fire. That but there, there, there is also actually one other thing, which is a good piece of advice is, you know, we definitely have types of people in the industry who are very much like, I need to make this as scientifically accurate as possible. This needs to work within the physics of our world, you know, and it's one of those things where you're going to be constantly fighting with people over critiques like that. Because there's real world, world science and then there's movie science, right? And <laughs> right. movie science is more like, does that look cool as opposed to like, oh, yeah, the wind shouldn't be working in that way if this object is moving. You know, like you can definitely go into those kind of details. But like at the end of the day, will the director think that looks cool and does that look like what he wanted? I think the probably the easiest way to talk about this because it's always fun. You know, granted you're at ILM, so everything you do is fabulous and amazing and is some of the best work ever. And I'm not saying that to be nice. It it really is. I'm a big Indiana Jones fan. I'm old enough to have gone to a screening of young Sherlock Holmes and been blown away of that as a kid. Just like, what just happened? The stained glass window guy came alive and it looked real and it scared the heck out of me. But for students and for people working in the industry, like you said, if the director thinks it's cool, it's cool. We're moving on. It's his job to, you know, he's at the helm of that. What are some of those badges of shame or some of those bad things or horror stories that, that come up when you're working on compositing and working on shots? We're like, okay, this is where this is going to go bad. These are the things we should have fixed before it got to post. Some of the things that we go, let, let's spend a little more time dealing with this first before we start, you know, hacking away at it. There are a lot of times when shooting people are stuck on a specific schedule. You need to get things done in X amount of time. There's no room for errors. And so when it comes to shooting, there's been so many situations where people are like, oh, just put a blue screen up there, put a green screen over there. And then they'll just like hodgepodge put like a bunch of screens with completely different hues and saturations of what they think is green, right? It's and all then green. they it's decide fine. to use a yeah, exactly. And then they decide to use a green screen, even though the main actor is blonde. And then you're just like, blonde hair over green. Ah! And it's just, you know, one of those things where I'm sure there's a reason that it couldn't have been a perfectly evenly lit green screen, you know, that was placed right. But they decide to use blue because the, the main actor is blonde. You know, it's just one of those things where you wish people had the time to be able to do that. That way it makes the life of a compositor much easier, but it's tough. Shooting schedules are tough. You got to make do with what you have. And, you know, as a compositor, it's, it's a good challenge to be able to extract very bad setup green screens. But, you know, at the same time, it's something that 
it's better to just do it right from the start. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that you, you, you mentioned that, that even in today's big productions, there's going to be stuff that is not the way it should be. You said, it's a good idea to learn how to do this kind of stuff. And you, know, I think in school and, and for people starting out, it's like, oh, it's got to be perfect. I got to get this perfect. How am I going to do this? What are some of those skills and some of that advice that you really want to give students coming out of programs going, okay, you're going to be a compositor. This is what your life is going to look like now. How, what, what does the life of a compositor look like? Oh, what does anyone's life look like these days? Um, <laughs> back, back when we were going I mean, to offices and things like that. Exactly. Back in pre-COVID times when <laughs> life was normal. When life um, was easy. No, I mean, I feel like as a compositor, you definitely can be one of those artists who walk into the office, sit at your desk, put on your headphones, put on some music, and you're just like, go, just working on your shots. But, you know, I feel like that's when you lose the fun of working in a collaborative space. Like, to me, I'm constantly trying to peek and see what other people are doing and just like discussing like what other folks are doing in their shots on different shows. And it's for me, I'm very much a person who loves being able to learn and also teach folks around me. I'm rarely just sitting at my desk. In fact, if you can find me at my desk, great job, because that's a very rare moment. Um, of course, during these working from home times, it's very different. I'm constantly at my desk, but now I'm constantly on video calls, which is a different thing. But yeah, I think, you know, a lot of a life of a compositor is very much you work on your shots, submit it for dailies, get your critique and review on your work go back to your desk and, you know, do another iteration and try to get that shot done in the least amount of iterations you can, because it's all about then moving on to the next shot and being able to work on multiple shots. Sometimes you're doing a bunch of different shots at the same time. It's one of those processes where, like, I absolutely love dailies because that's when we get to talk with the supervisors and other artists who happen to be there, you know, on their thoughts and ideas of, like, whether or not your shot is working. And so... The more you can discuss things and the less you just sit at your desk again and work, you know, the more you can get to that final execution of your shot being done. Uh, and that because it's it, it's 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 interesting that you're, you're 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 explaining how you know much collaboration goes into this, because I think a lot of people come to I, I want to work on computers. I like computers. I like this digital world. It, it's I can zone in and zone out. It, it's fascinating how you're saying, no, you got to go out and you got to sh- talk to people, look at people, look at things, see things. You know, we talked a little bit at the top about how you got into ILM, but what brought you into this world of wanting to do composite or was it was it a roundabout way or it was like, I'm going to do compositing done. Oh, it's completely roundabout way. I mean, I feel like I didn't even really know or dabble into visual effects until like within my college years. And I feel like it was one of those things where I've always loved art and I've always loved technology. And to me, I'm just like, whatever merges the two together, that sounds like my dream job. And when I was first getting into it, it was more because I was super into the Spice Girls and I was making Spice Girls websites. And so that's when I was like, I got to learn like some HTML and JavaScript, but I'm also doing some like photo manipulation to put up on my website. And so I was actually thinking I would be going into more web design and development when I went to college as opposed to filmmaking. But then when I was in college, I majored in studio art and got introduced more into like photography and video production. And I was like, oh, this is really, really cool. I really love this medium, this form of capturing moments. And that's when I started to look and dive into the world of filmmaking and TV. It was one of those things where I was like, I get my thrills of technology with, you know, such a digital medium that it is today, right? Being able to manipulate pixels and images. But at the same time, it's it's very creative, right? It's very open-ended to make your content however you like. And so I eventually got more into motion graphics. And once I got into motion graphics, it was pretty much open door. Is it visual effects I want to get into or do I want to stick with motion graphics? And it was one of those things where, you know, I just wanted to work in a place that would let me interact and learn from all sorts of different types of people, whether it be technology or whether it be art. 
ILM has always been such an innovation when it comes to filmmaking, whether it be back in the days of, you know, how they did optical printing to nowadays, like, were we taking the medium of CG and digital art creation? So, yeah, that's why I was very much drawn to ILM, not so much for, you know, oh, my God, they work on Star Wars and Indiana Jones, which is a huge plus. Don't get huge me wrong. Thing, huge thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Huge thing. But it, it was more just the fact that they are so enveloped in the history and the pushing forward of innovation regarding filmmaking these days. So, yeah. As you explain, that makes a lot more sense for people to start thinking, well, you know, what's your company doing? What, where are you going to be going? How is your career going to advance? And how are you, your skills going to advance? That makes total sense. How far away are you from completing the Great Spice Girls CG film? Are you, are you all the way done? <laughs> that, that is a good question. I would, uh, um, I, I, I can't disclose sign, that I'll, information. Okay, I'll sign the NDA, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, are we, we fully done or just, you know? You'll, you'll okay. see right. one day, one day. Okay. To shift a little bit. Well, actually, I, you know, one more question before we shift. Give me your top 10. Oh, your top. I'm not going to force you to answer 10. But moments that you've worked on and projects you've worked on where you've gone, this doesn't look like CG. We did such a good job. This is amazing. What are, what are some of those projects you worked on or some of those scenes where you just look at and go, yeah, this is the best? That's a really fun question. But it's also a very curious question to me because I'm all like, who defines what that CG look? Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a long right? time. You know, you know, like, I worked in film and worked in photography. And, you know, you, know, you can sit around with a bunch of photographers and you look, oh, you, you see that rim light? You see how good that rim light looks? Nobody got thought about that fair, rim light. Fair. I brought that in. It's there. It makes the scene. I don't care what Tom Cruise says. The rim light made it. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there are definitely scenarios where it's like, you know, it's fake. There's no, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Again, we're in space. This is space. You know, like, <laughs> of course. Um, but in space. <laughs> but, at, but at the same time, like, so much of it is so dependent on the storytelling, right? Like, is the visual effects actually working in parallel with the story to the point that you, as a audience, don't think that, like, oh, I have a moment to think about it. Deconstruct the shot and be like, this looks really fake, you know? If you are immersed in that story and that visual is not real, then you're, you will think it is real, you know? And so to me, picking out top ones is, is very difficult. I know, um, I know. But for sure, I remember when I was working on the Rogue One trailer and it was the first time we saw like the Star Destroyer and the Death Star. And it was one of those things where... John Null, you know, was very adamant about making sure that we match the CG to the original Death Star model, to okay. the actual practical set models that were used in the past. And so, you know, it's one of those things where it's like you're matching CG to something that was physically made but doesn't actually exist in life. But at the same time, because of the way it was, you know, being portrayed in the trailer and the story that it was telling – you know, you're not thinking about that looks fake. You're just like, well, this is a really like epic moment that's happening. And that's got to be bizarre because you know, you're, you know, not only that, you're, you're creating, trying to emulate something that was relatively low budget compared to modern times. Like that was just a bunch of plastic model airplane parts that didn't look great. It looked amazing then. And now I, I can make it better. I know I can. No. There is canon here. There is lore. There is, you know, there, there. You know, yeah, there's, feeling. there's so many different facets and reasoning behind why you make a certain CG element or asset, right? And it's one of those things where, like you were saying, it, it wasn't a high budget, you know, practical model that they made. But at the same time, again, referring back to what I said earlier, if you keep it simple. Sometimes that's the most effective way to show your CG renders, to show your final product. Because it's, it's when we overcomplicate things and, you know, go way too much. I guess that's what looks too CG, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's the same thing with, you know, there's all the fuss around digital doubles and, like, deep fake and machine learning and, like, you know, humans that are being reproduced in a CG way. The AI And I feel a lot of, yeah... I feel like a lot of the issue with that is that we're looking to try and reproduce this like perfect human 
but there's no such thing as a perfect human, right? Like what makes a human register another human is the imperfections of the human form. Things like if your face is asymmetrical as opposed to being symmetrical, you know, that's how like there's definitely ways that our brain subconsciously is aware that things don't look real. So, so something, again, it's something one of those is things, not right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just one of those things where it's all like stop trying to reach that perfect ideal scenario and allow those human imperfections to also um, show through in your composites, in your shots. That was a very, very, very politically correct and nice way of not saying what you liked better. But then I'm going to ask you a different question then. What's some of your favorite CG moments where you look at and go, that was just cool? Oh, doesn't have there's to be so one. many of that. doesn't have yeah. to be one you worked on. What, what's, what's one of the, what, well, as a compositor, you know, we all have our favorite. You know, we all have our favorite thing that, that we've looked at. You know, you know, it doesn't have to be yours, of course, that you just look and go, God, that thing, that thing just really does it for me. What's one of those ones that you just go, I like that one? Ooh, I feel like, I mean, it's too, super fangirl of me to say this, but in the original Star Wars trilogy, at the end of episode four, there was that scene where Luke is looking out on the horizon with the two moons, and it's like a sunset set up. And it's just one of those things where it's all like, it's so beautifully shot. It's so beautifully set up. There's no two moons anywhere for us. You know, in reality, it was clearly manipulated. But again, it's one little thing, but it's such a iconic image that burns in my head. And, you know, it's, 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 it's funny you mentioned something that really doesn't have a whole lot of CG in it. It's a lot of that practical, you know, let's go out to a desert and film it and do our best to match two moon-like substances together to get that story across. That, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. And, you know, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And, and the thing is, like, you know, there's definitely really big CG shots, without a doubt, the most recent Avengers, when they all just, like, come together through all their portals and stuff like that. It's a wow moment, you yeah. know, in that film. It's, again, one of those things where it's like, oh, there's also a lot going on. And I like my brain just feels super overloaded. And I'm like, the visual effects artist in me is just like, I must deconstruct all of this. What is going on over there? What is going, you know, it's just like one of those things where I'm suddenly just taken out of the film. And I just like really want to analyze things. So you, you can't, horrible. so the answer is you can't watch CG without you know putting on your, your work brain going, I see what you did there. I don't agree. I would do it, it, it is <laughs> it is very hard to disconnect that that is for sure okay, um, okay that that's but... a fair answer that's acceptable <laughs> I know I you know I had to put you on the spot because you know you're you're the expert on this I do want to switch gears a little bit because I think you know something that you do personally is so important and so amazing especially with everything that's been going on is your women in FX group explain that for people who've, who've not seen it and I know why it's important but you know you will do a much better job of explaining it than I will. What brought your women in effects group to the forefront? What was the reason behind it? I pretty much have been thinking about doing a project like this for a while now. Like I mentioned earlier in college, I focus on photography and video production. And a lot of the things that I produce videos of was more on a documentative style. I love doing interviews. I love, you know, learning more from folks. And so I had this thought in my mind where like, I've never really heard the experiences and stories of women within our industry. And I felt like a lot of times when I do watch behind the scenes commentaries or video interviews of visual effects artists who worked on big projects, it's always some guy telling his experience and his story, which is great. You know, they're amazing, talented people. But, you know, it's one of those things where I'm just like, I can't really relate to these kind of experiences that they're talking about. And so it was pretty much around 2016, there was a certain election going on in the States. You don't say. Um, that was very, very hot topic. You know, I just felt like, you know what? We might have our first ever woman president. Why are we not doing anything as an industry? I think it's time that I like, start just sitting down with the women that I know in the industry who are complete badasses and let me record and hear what their stories and experiences are. 
And it was just one of those things by just like word of mouth where once one woman is like, oh, I was able to talk to Charmaine about like this and she recorded it and she's going to like make a video series out of it. It kind of spread and every woman that I knew was like very much like, I want to be a part of this. And it was just one of those things where I wanted to help amplify and let everyone in the world know what these women's experiences has been like. So just got around to interview as many people as I could. Started originally with just, you know, the women in the San Francisco ILM office. But then I was like, you know, it's a very limited perspective. I just do one group of people here. And so occasionally when I'd be like out on vacation somewhere, I'd be like, is there another visual effects studio in this town that I'm visiting? Are there people I can interview? And so I started just like reaching out to folks and we've done interviews in Vancouver. We've done interviews in London. We've done Singapore. Wherever I can get these stories, I want to do that because after a while, you'll definitely start noticing certain themes pop up, right? And it's one of those things that's like the more we acknowledge the issues, you know, whether it be maternity leave issues or working crazy hour issues or, you know, sometimes there are really horrible stories of harassment going on and, you know, catcalling and just like the environment of Hollywood, the environment of tech industry, like, you know, it definitely has a somewhat you know, boys club feeling to it, which can be not absolutely, inclusive absolutely. Yeah. for folks, you know. And, and, yeah, it, well, and, and when I was looking, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying, and, you know, just being able to talk out loud about it and acknowledge that it does exist, it helps people realize that they're not alone, that we can reach out to one another for help and that these are things that we want to combat as an industry together. There's a lot of women in the film industry, but you're right. It's definitely like not public facing. I mean, you know, the history of of editing, it was women did the cutting of the film, never the editing. And it was a very controlled situation. Do you see now for women coming up in the industry that there is more opportunity or is there some things that you can recommend for women coming up to think about, okay, these are the things you're going to have to face. These are the things you want to start preparing yourself for, whether it be portfolio or interviewing, anything like that, that, you know, you can, you can speak to for the women coming up in the industry. I'll be honest, right? The visual effects industry is not easy. It is tough. We are dealing with very tight deadlines on small budgets and it, kind of has created this environment where you're working really long hours and you're away from people a lot. And it's somehow become the culture of visual effects, which, you know, is is a shame. But I think there's a bigger issue besides, you know, besides there's not enough women in industry. The bigger issue is that we don't create an environment where people can have a life, right? We just expect people to be button pushers and get images out the door. And that's, that's not something that's healthy for anyone, nor should be an industry that we should be promoting. But at the same time, I think for us to acknowledge these things and therefore change the culture of our communities to not work long hours, and you can still get that shot to look good in eight hours, you know, like, don't slave over it. You're more productive as an artist when you've slept right. than when you haven't slept, <laughs> <Right>. you know? <laughs> and that third 12 hour day, you're just mush. It's like, why we, why exactly. do you do this? What's, what's the point of this? Yeah. There's a lot of those root things we need to change. And because of that, I think a more diverse amount of people will be more interested in the industry, right? It's one of those things where we've so this industry has like, oh, you have to work long hours and, and then you'll get those cool shots. And then that's how you have your like badge of duty, you know, and honor that you are a VFX artist. And it's like, no, we just need to step away from that. And I feel like the more companies acknowledge that and step away from that, we will get, again, more of that diverse set pool of artists. But, you know, to be honest, in the last 15 years working in the industry, I've definitely seen a huge increase of women coming in, into the industry. I think the hard part is retaining that talent because there's so many of them that are super talented. But, you know, again, life comes up, right? Like if you want to have a kid, it's hard to leave, have your kid and come back and still be at the same point in your career. And that that's not just, you know, strictly to visual effects that that's That's, an an issue across the board. Yeah. 
the unfair burden that women are you know looked upon it's like well you you, you went on maternity leave you're done it's like yeah no. and so it's one of those things where if a female supervisor did leave on maternity and came back she should still be able to supervise there should be no reason why she can't continue working because now she has a kid it's one of those things where it's like we need to make sure that we we can do our work in eight hours again it's one of those things where we need to be more realistic about the work that we're bidding out for um and not expect everyone to always work overtime it's, Plus, it's, it's it's not good for you bottom line either well, yeah, it's, you know? it's, it's, it's interesting you're mentioning this there's another person we talked to who works in the film industry as a storyboard artist in a bigger company and she she mentioned the same thing and it was interesting that it, it's women bringing these up and being more vocal about it you would think some of us dumb guys would be the ones saying it but like you don't need to be working 20 hours a day it's stupid what are you doing this is cruel and unusual <laughs> You're absolutely right. I mean, the, hands down. For the women's group, where can we find that information? Because that, you know, as much as we want people to look at compositing, you know, getting support is just as important, if not more. Where can they find out the information on the women in VFX? If you just go to womeninvfx.com, we have our main website there. We also have our Twitter and YouTube handles, which is Women in VFX as well. So it's pretty much the same across pretty the board. Simple. Pretty good. Yeah. That makes it easy. <laughs> cool. Any last thoughts on, you know, what you think? I know there's a million, million, million things, but what's that one thing you want somebody to be thinking about when they're coming out of school? What's that one piece of advice that they really need to keep in the forefront when they're going to be working in the industry? The one thing that I generally tell most folks is that if you are really passionate about filmmaking, if you're passionate about visual effects and visual storytelling, just keep going at it. You might not be doing the role or the task or the shots that you always want to do, but if you keep at it and people can, you know, sense your, your love for this, you'll eventually get there and be patient. It's not about getting the biggest shot all the time. It's about so much more, you know, from learning what other departments and disciplines do to basic soft skills where you're like getting to know people. Because, again, back to the collaboration, so much of it is just learning and feeding off of other folks' ideas because that's what helps you grow as an artist and that's what helps you grow as a person as well. So there you go. A little look into the world of virtual production, compositing and some behind the scenes on Star Wars' The Mandalorian. Because if you've ever dreamed about a career in art and design, good news is more and more art and design career opportunities are on the rise. And employers are always on the hunt for the next generation of talented and, of course, skilled creative professionals. At Academy of Art University, you will get those work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco or anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request info about our 40-plus areas of study in art and design, including visual effects, animation, game design, and more, visit our website at academyart.edu slash creativemind. I'm Bobby Brill. Thanks for listening. How about that nutty Star Wars bar? Can you forget all the creatures in there? And hey, Darth Vader in that black and evil mask, did he scare you as much as he scared me? Ah! Star Wars! Those near in Star Wars! My seventh winner up here! Star